All right. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of Teen Talk Live. I am your host, Ann Dillard. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I am so excited to come to you on this weekly platform sharing knowledge and tips and strategies to empower and transform um, lives and minds, All right. right? Okay, good evening, everyone. So I'm everyone. just checking good out my and sound here and making sure that I can see you and I can hear you. And tonight we have a treat for you. Hey, Catrice. Hey, Dr. Adrian. Thank you for joining. Hey, Daryl. Thanks for joining. We have a treat for you tonight because we have none other than my friend, my colleague, um, Chastity Chandler, who is the sex therapist, and she's going to help us have this conversation, critical conversation. So think about your questions, start dropping them in the comment section because we want to hear from Chastity tonight. Catrice says, hey, ladies. Hey, Catrice, thanks for joining. Hey, hey girl. Kathy. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Tell, tell the viewers who you are and what it is that you do. Oh, awesome. So as Ann said, my name is Chastity Chandler. I am a private practice clinician down in Florida. So I'm a licensed mental health counselor as well as a certified sex therapist and a few other credentials. But what I basically do is I help people uh, to get help without the guilt and shame uh, that kind of surrounds it. And I pride myself on holding a space that is very uh, encouraging and empowering. And so that's what we do here at the Center for Sexual Health and Wellness. Thank you. And we're going to jump right in because you said something that's really, really key. A lot of times when we think about sex and we think about talking about sex, it's always that um, not every time, but a lot of times, especially as a teenager, it's always that taboo kind of shame that goes along with it. And so can you help us understand a little bit about where does that come from and um, most of my viewers are parents, so we want to help them navigate those delicate com or delicate conversation and those sensitive feelings that go along with it. So where, where does some of that come from, Chad? I think the taboo kind of comes from generation through generation to, through generation, right? So if I'm a parent and I feel like uh, sex or topics associated with sex are, are taboo or shame-filled or are bad and sinful, uh, then that kind of carries along to my offspring, right? Uh, the kids kind of sense it. You, you feel a certain way when a certain um, scene comes on the TV or you have a certain point of view about a certain thing. Um, and if they see that you're not a person that they can actually explore this conversation with, then nine times out of 10, as I, as I put in an article I contributed to, I think two years ago now, was they're either learning it from the internet from their friends or possibly uh, their friends' moms or their friends' parents. If their friends' parents are more quote unquote cool or easier to talk to, they may be reaching out to somebody else to have these conversations. And so I think one of the first things we need to do is uh, kind of embrace the fact that we are sexual beings. This whole notion that we're gonna treat everything holistic, right? And we're just gonna leave sexual completely out of it. Right. Um, I think it's a disservice to both ourselves, uh, if, if we are a, a clinician, a therapist, or a helper to the people we serve, and uh, definitely a disservice to our kids. Well, even, even as a parent, I mean, we want to make sure that our kids get a, a balanced spiritual diet. We want to make sure that, you know, they have physical activities, and we want to make sure that um, they, they're doing well academically, but I can't even say for myself as a parent, um, their sexual well-being was something that was a priority. And it, it absolutely has to be in today's time. It has to be. I remember when I was writing that article, I think at the time my daughter might have been 14. And mm -hmm. I asked her a question, 14 in middle school. I asked her a question. I said, hey, what do you know about sex? She blushed and she was like, I'm not talking to you about this. I was like, cool. She was like, but you can call my bestie. So. I call her bestie, I FaceTime her, and 
they're like 13 and 14 and in middle school and kids are having sex behind the bleachers in the, in the gym, they're performing all types of sexual acts. And, uh, basically we're able to describe in, in vast detail, uh, the various, uh, sexual acts that some of their, uh, classmates, uh, were engaging in. And so to sit and think that our kids don't know, especially when we're in the age of smartphones is probably not a smart assumption, you know, uh, I teach human sexuality every now and then. It's my favorite uh, class to teach. And masturbation takes place in the womb. So to think that we are born into this world and even before we even breathe the oxygen on this earth, uh, there can be a sexual moments. So to think that our 14, 15, 16, heck, eight-year-old, seven-year-old sons and daughters are not engaging in or curious about sex, uh, I think is a vast uh, misconception. I think I think you are right because um, again there was so much there has been so much shame and so much taboo around the topic of sex because it's seen in a lot of um, venues is talked about as something so dirty something so sinful something so wrong and um, and so if you're not able to talk to your parents about it then you know there's all these other avenues open and willing to share with you about it right like you said mm -hmm. the internet that's that's like i it's so amazing to me and not amazing in a good way but so amazing to me the level of access that our teenagers or or even preteens have to the internet and they're not putting the boundaries on that we would put as parents and so our kids have all this information and then they're just running it by their their besties who has who have in most cases the same level of information that they have. Absolutely, man. We and then I always say, you know, maybe I'm a parent that is not comfortable talking about sex or maybe my first sexual experiences were not uh, pleasant or healthy. You know, there are people out there that can help you to explore um, these conversations with your kids. There are products that are out there that can help prepare you to explore these conversations uh, with your kids. But to just ignore it, um, I think is half, if not all of the problem we have as it relates to the lack of knowledge in this uh, fear that we instill into our kids as it relates about sex. You know, we want to talk about how you shouldn't do it, how it will relate um, how it will in turn cause pregnancy or et cetera and how you should be abstinent. But we don't have the conversations about um, pleasure. We don't have the conversations about how do you know when you're going to be ready. And we don't, we don't um, create an environment where our kids can actually come to us a lot of times with when they are ready and how do we help them to protect themselves and how do we navigate that when my kid is ready and they want to do it. You know, even if that goes against, you know, my belief system or what I felt I had for them, you know, how do I go about uh, navigating that arena? Yeah, that's, you know, especially when we're talking about teens, um, those are topics and areas that's usually not associated with sex in that conversation, like sex being pleasurable or sex being something that's wonderful and fun and, and things like that. It's usually, again, don't do it. If you do it, you'll get pregnant or you get an STD. And so sex is so much more than just intercourse and so much more than pregnancy and so much more than STDs. But if we're not helping to pass on this healthy concept on a, or a healthy narrative around it, it, it creates so much problems. Absolutely. I remember one time I was on the phone with Bay and we were talking and I was like, oh, you sound sexy. Uh, I was like, so are you sleepy? Are you sexy? Because last night you were trying to be uh, sexy and you were sleepy. And my son was in the car. He was like, "Ooh, mama, you said a bad word. And I said, what word did I say bad? He said the S word. I said, you mean sex? And he was like, yeah, I said sex is not a bad word. I said, it's just something that kids shouldn't do. And that was my that was my explanation to him, you know, so how we respond 
to comments, to situations uh, as it relates to sex with our kids can either make or break their confidence and their demeanor as it relates to them as a sexual being. You know, like I mentioned masturbation earlier, masturbation is a natural part of our sexual, our psychosexual development, right? So if you catch your child, I mean, what happens? We touch ourselves, it feels good, right? We know this, right? So you don't think a kid knows this? And when they do it, how do you respond as a parent? You know, right. for my kids, I told my kids, you know, that's something you do in private. That's not something you do in front of other people. Mm -hmm. But I didn't dare tell my son or my daughters, like, that's not something you do. Because again, it could really stunt their development mm -hmm. sexually. And you know how many uh, women are, are, are grown adults that I meet who can't, they don't even know how to please themselves, let alone help their partners to navigate their bodies. And part of that came from what was instilled in them as kids as how bad sex was and how touching yourself was bad and how it was going to cause you to go blind and all of these other uh, myths associated with, you know, masturbation, et cetera. And so again, really looking at what was the narrative that was mentioned or told to us, what was the conversation? Some of us didn't get the conversation or we didn't get the conversation until it was too late. Exactly. Right. And when I say too late, I mean like pregnant. <laughs> you didn't discuss this with me and now I got to come to you and tell you uh that I'm pregnant and right. and now it's a big thing and it's something because masturbation is a big topic and it's there's so much taboo around it and and um I think that it's something that it's a conversation that every family has to have it's an important conversation to navigate because uh, I don't know um a lot of times, you know, when when we talk to especially um, teenagers and, and developing teen boys who are going through those phases and they don't understand what's happening in their bodies and their bodies are changing and this this feels good, but then they can form some additional habits that go along with that that causes more dysfunction later in their sexual life. And so I think being able to have that conversation uh, is so key, it's so key. Like I work with um, childcare providers and sometimes they get really, really uh, afraid and scared when, when they notice a toddler is, is rocking themselves and soothing themselves to go to sleep. And they're like, oh my God, what should, what should we do? What should we do? And, and it's like, and it's as young as that, that we start sending that message that doing um, something so natural is so bad. And so I had to help uh, some of my clients to, okay, take the lens off of, okay, this is bad, or this is, this is sexual. If you deem sexual as bad and say, he's, providing, uh, that's a soothing mechanism to go to bed or to go to sleep. And so understanding that at such a young age and us as adults having that knowledge to be able to navigate those conversations, those spaces is so critical. And from a, a personal and professional standpoint, I think we're sexualizing way too many things. And I think that that says a lot about the adults uh, who are navigating these conversations. Not everything is sexual. Not everything is about sex and not everything is, is, is a good or bad type situation. And I think there's way too much of that in today's time of sexualizing everything. That is so true. And I'm going to come back to that because I want to, I want to pick up that comment, but let me take time to welcome our guests. Hey, Lakeisha, hey, Ivy, thank you for being here. And Cecile said, hey, ladies, hey, Cecile, thank you hey. for joining us. Felicia, I'm glad you're here with us. And um, Lakeisha is inviting her friends to join this conversation. Sabra says, hey, ladies, thank you for joining us, Sabra. And Lamar, thanks for being here. Katrice says, um, yes, I have a 17 and a 25 year old and sex is definitely a topic of conversation. I have clients as early as seventh grade having sex. That is so, so true. Sure. And, and not necessarily, they're doing an act, but not necessarily understanding what it is that they're doing without the conversation and without guidance. And Kelly is here. Thank you. Lamar say it's scary. 
uh, Sabre said, hey, ladies, Dr. Paula is here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Catrice's social media is a big influence. Yes, Catrice, it really is. Um, Sabre said, Chastity Chandler, the expert is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and um Cecile says I think the how on different levels is critical and I was going to expound upon that the how on different oh she mean like on how to talk to our kids I I believe so um expound on that Cecile what do you mean the how the how is as in the me mechanism of sexual act or how to talk to your kids about it let's know which how you're talking about Natalie say, hey guys, hey Nat. Um, Rashida is here and watching on Instagram. Um, no, Rashida Ingram is here and watching. Um, Cecile says, how to discuss, I mean. We need okay. to discuss on many levels before they are ready, okay? So Absolutely. that's coming up. We're gonna talk about how to engage in these conversations. Adriel is here and Renell is here. Lots of people are here joining this conversation. Raylene, thanks for being here. Felicia Martin, Dr. Alvin, thanks for being here. Reshma, thank you for being here. Sis Kimball, thanks for being here. Shate. Thank you um, for joining your business bestie tonight and Sharon Lawrence, thanks for being here. Oh my goodness. So we have a, a full house of people who are contributing to this conversation. So let's go, um, let, we're gonna talk about the how, but let's go back to the point, um, Chastity, about we over-sexualize everything or too much, too much. Um. Well, there's a lot of uh, body shaming and victim blaming, you know, oh, well, if they didn't dress this way, this wouldn't happen. I remember there was a thing about uh, the dance group. I think it was down here in South Florida and what they were wearing. And everybody was like, they don't need to be wearing that. They're going to attract young. They're going to attract grown men. If a grown man is attracted to a young girl, that attraction didn't come about because the young girl had on something uh some sort of clothing per se um you know those types of attractions don't necessarily occur just because of a piece of clothing that you have on uh nor is that a, an excuse uh or uh an explanation as to why these girls can't wear what they're supposed to wear to dance i mean there's always been a certain level of um a certain expectation of the clothing for dance teams and for cheerleaders and et cetera. And, and that, that's, that's not going to attract a grown man uh, to think about this child in a sexual way. Well, let me, let me interject and, and kind of play devil's advocate for a second. Go for it. So in, par, in parts of society, we're, we're brought up to think that or to understand that men are visual. So whatever you put in front of them, you then, um, are blamed as the woman for putting that visual there because men are stimulated visually. So, <laughs> and then that um, in a lot of cases relinquished them at, of the responsibility of acting as a grown person. Gotcha. I think that's way too much of that going on, too. I follow a couple of different pages and things on Facebook, and I swear us women, we get blamed for everything. Men don't have to take responsibility for many actions nowadays. I thought we were going to be taking accountability in 2019. But let me just say this. Uh, there are many different types of people in this world. There are many different types of sexual attraction. There's many different love and relationship types. Uh, me, myself, personally, I see and treat all. Um, and so I have ran the gamut of those different sexual um, attractions, relationship types, gender identities, sexual and, and relationship love types. I, I see it all. We could pretty much put blame on anybody about anything if we're going to really get nitpicky, et cetera. If I want to wear booty shorts and walk down the road in booty shorts, that does not give anybody the right to violate me sexually. It doesn't give anybody the right to, to touch me or treat me differently because I want to wear booty shorts down the road. Um, at the end of the day, there are certain um, athletic events and there are certain activity, extracurricular activities that come along with a certain type of uniform. I mean, that's not been I mean, we don't look at it the same if we have a gymnast 
uh, doing gymnastics on the floor and they have the tight leotard on. We don't look at that any different, but if you got this girl with maybe a shorter skirt, uh, some leggings or tights on, or maybe they got on heels because they walk in a, a line, now that's sexualized and they're going to sexually attract someone. And so I think there's just kind of like a, it's a double standard. And I think it has a lot to do with culture as well. Uh, you know, certain cultures, certain body types, um, you know, I, I, I'm shapely. Uh, there's certain things, there's nothing I'm going to put on that's going to completely hide what I was blessed with. You understand what I'm saying? And kids right. nowadays, a lot of times are way more developed than we are as adults who've had kids. And I mean, I get it. There are ways in which we might suggest our kids to dress in certain types of clothing. And I get all of that. But this whole idea that if you wear this, you're a slut. Or if you wear this, you're asking for this. Um, I think it just takes away from the ability of people to just express themselves. You know, our uh, how we show up in bodies and encompasses who we are as a sexual being. I love to wear my heels. Those who know me know I love my heels. Does wearing my heels make me a slut? The higher the heel, the more slutty I am? Or is it just an expression of me and my femininity that I love to wear heels? Mm -hmm. Does it have to be a sexual notion to it? Mm -hmm. Or can I just love to wear heels is what I'm saying. Everything is so. Right. And I think, I think, I think what you're saying, you know, is very valid because it, it again puts the onus on the woman to take care of herself, protect herself, and also guard herself from potential predators. Uh, let's talk about that. I'm glad you brought up potential predators because I know we're talking about kids and teens and, and when to start talking to them about sex. And, you know, I always hear, you know, this is why I don't let my kids be around strangers. This is why this don't happen. You know, statistically speaking, the people who harm our kids are not the strangers. That's not who we need to that. necessarily be looking out for. It's the people that we trust our kids with. Sometimes it's us meaning the parents, it's close friends, it's the pastor, it's the counselor, it's the coach, it's the, it's the people who have built these intimate and trusting relationships with our kids, uh, who, who potentially are the ones, more times than not, who actually sexually violate our children. So it's not the strangers so much we got to be worried about. It's the people that you got your guard down on. It's the people who you, quote unquote, would have never suspected. Uh, it could be the other parents. It could be, uh, yeah, a sibling. It could be uh, that, that cousin. Um, I deal a lot with people who are survivors of sexual abuse. Uh, and that stuff doesn't go away. Um, right. You know, my, myself, I'm a survivor. And what I can say is that, you know, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't told to my seven-year-old self. Uh, you know, and there was a lot that I didn't disclose until I was a grown-up. Um, you know, a lot of times the, the child doesn't know that what's being done to them is wrong. That's right. And again, our body responds to what feels good. So even if it is inappropriate or if it is illegal or if it wasn't consensual, does not mean that our body is not going to respond. Uh, lots of rape victims have this, uh, this uh, inner conflict. You know, I was raped, but I had an orgasm. So did that mean that I liked it? Did that mean that I it was warranted? Uh, no, our body is our body and physiologically it's going to respond uh, regardless if it was warranted, uh, wanted or not. Um, and so with that being said, we have to know that there are people who are grooming our kids. There are people who don't just see your kid as this innocent person. They may be visualizing them in a sexual way. It may actually be what is going on. And, and typically they will groom our kids. And so they get close to them. They earn their trust. They start giving them extra privileges and, and, and extra uh, activities, money, toys, anything that will, you know, and then they make it their little secret. Exactly. You know, and so I think that brings us to one of the house. You know, I used to be one of those parents that had all those little uh, cute little nicknames for the body parts, you know, even though I am a survivor, even though I work in this field. I remember going to a sexual assault or sexual abuse training and the lady told a story about uh, the young girl was going to her therapist and kept telling her therapist that her dad was going to her kitchen. Right. The therapist didn't catch on. So what we must know is a lot of times the predators or those who are sexually attracted to kids will groom them by also nicknaming their body parts. So when us, uh, 
uh, Cecile asked about the how, the first how is for us to teach and empower our kids on what their body parts are actually called. So penis, right. vaginal, testicles, testes, uh, buttocks, we got to empower them to be able to know that. And we also need to let them know that nobody, including ourselves at a certain point, should exactly. be touching them in those spaces. So at some point, your kid has to learn how to bathe themselves. At some point, we have to make sure that they know that these are parts of my body that nobody should be touching unless I want them to and unless I have okayed it. Exactly. Right. And so I think that's the first line of defense. And some might say, well, when does that need to start happening? And my opinion as a professional uh, and as a mother is that it needs to start happening as soon as your child can start talking. So when the first words start coming in, we need to be teaching them these words as well and what they go along with and how they can communicate to us if somebody is doing something that is inappropriate or harmful. I, that is so true. And I remember I started talking with my kids every time I would put them in the tub. We were talking about body parts. We were talking about, you know, this is your private part, you know, and, and, and put in, um, giving them that information, which wasn't scary. And, and I think if the more you give that information and start giving it age appropriate doses, it doesn't become as scary. And then when things out of the norm, happens then the kids are more inclined to come to you about it with because you didn't put that initial shame there yeah absolutely I mean it's it's just like if you walked in on your child masturbating what would be your response mm -hmm. and we don't think but that initial response can set the tone for the rest of your child's psychosexual development and what they feel is quote-unquote good or bad which inflicts shame and guilt and so we have to be mindful of how we respond, uh, how comfortable you are versus when you talk to your kid. Maybe you're not comfortable. Maybe you need to go talk to somebody. Maybe you need to take a webinar. Maybe you need to take a course on how to, a workshop on how to talk to your kid about sex. So you, you kind of get some feedback and some, uh, some guidance on how to navigate that conversation. But I just want to definitely put a, a cautionary, uh, some caution in, not having the conversation because you're not comfortable. And I think that's really good. You know, yesterday I was out in public and this one woman who I know, she approached me and we were talking and her teen daughter happened to walk up and she said, I want you to meet Miss Ann and I want you to meet her because um, she's having the show about sex and, she, and, and, and I want you to listen to it. And she went on to say, you know, sometimes she was talking to her daughter. She said, sometimes mama don't know the right things to say. And sometimes I just, I just can't do it. And so I want you to have an avenue where you can get the right information. And I thought that was just such a beautiful, beautiful interaction happening awesome. right in front of my face. Because sometimes we don't have the skills. Sometimes we have our own um, shame and, and, um, legacy burdens that we're dealing with and it's hard to help somebody navigate that right because of of the different levels of of triggers that that causes us right so i think that's one of the another one of the house is find somebody capable to have that that um conversation absolutely if you're not able to now i see that we have a question and uh Dechelle says at what age would you talk to kids about sex? Like I said, uh, age appropriate doses, I say from the time they start actually uh, speaking, but as far as you mean like the sexual act or acts of sex or sexual intercourse, I mean, again, age appropriate. I wouldn't wait until, uh, you know, they got their period or they had their first wet dream. I would, I would definitely uh, begin at this nowadays. Hmm. Again, I still say age appropriate and that's really up to the parents, but I would definitely say somewhere between seven and nine. I yeah. wouldn't put the conversation off too far past that because you got to understand nowadays too, a lot of kids are actually uh, having their menses at a very early age. And so if exactly. I start my menses at eight and you didn't have this conversation with me, I could be a mother by, by nine. Yes. I mean, that's the reality of the world that we live in. Um, and so I think age appropriate, small dosages. And then with what's out there outside of social media, regular TV, there's very few shows that I see that doesn't have some sort of interaction 
um, sexually. I mean, heck, they're, they're kissing on Disney Channel now. So we really have to have these conversations sooner than later and maybe even just setting the tone. You know, hey, what do you know about sex? Our kids will more than likely probably be very timid and shy. They're not going to want to have the conversation. But if you were the one who brings up the conversation and maybe engage and see where they are on their knowledge or what they know, you never know what door that might open. Because maybe at nine, I'm not ready to have that conversation with you. But maybe at 12, because you brought it up at nine, now I know you might be a safe person and someone I can feel comfortable navigating that conversation. So to each his own on when you have the conversation, I can't really tell you when or where to have it. But what I can tell you is the earlier, the better. Right. And again, age appropriate dosages. So nine times out of 10, by the time a, a child is seven to nine, they've discovered their bodies. And so Absolutely. if you're paying attention and or have had that conversation with them, I think it kind of comes in layers. Exactly. But, but for us to feel like the kid is too young, but yet we, we they got a smartphone. If they got a smartphone, they have access to all of this and much, much more. Yes. And so, yes. Whew. I, I think I think that's important, and I also think that it's important that we extend our our narrative of sex beyond intercourse. Absolutely. And talk about you know it's more than pregnancy it's more than stds it's it's talking about talking to our kids about sexting that's a big thing amongst teens absolutely right and, and i see it all the time and i don't think teens know the ramifications of sexting no a lot of times they don't and then legal age for consent is big i live in florida we're one of those states that's very strict on that and i know kids who have been labeled as sex offenders for simply uh doing what used to be done back in the day like like mooning or something as simple as uh urinating in public uh if a child is anywhere in the vicinity and sees that you can easily be uh, uh labeled as a sex offender in, in florida the age of consent is 16 so if 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 my if my child is 16 and they engage in a sexual act with a 15 year old, that is a crime. That is statutory rape in our state, right? Uh, doesn't matter if my child consented to it, doesn't really matter if I was even okay with it. The state attorney can pick it up and that child's life, will, I don't wanna say the life will be over, but it will be drastically impacted. Drastically impacted. Drastically impacted. That is a federal offense. And a lot of times parents don't really know um, the legal issues around sexting. So there was a huge case, I think it was in Houston, where a 16-year-old girl was sharing body parts mm -hmm. with, um, with, a, with her boyfriend, mm -hmm. but she was charged and she had to register as a sex offender. Because Distribution of child porn. Mm -hmm. It's illegal for mm -hmm. children to send parts or, or receive pictures of your private parts on, on, on texts, on emails and stuff like that. And the other part about it is for people who open that and continue to send that and continue to view that, that's also illegal. Yep, distribution of child porn. You can be labeled a of child porn. And I don't think a lot of people understand the legal ramifications. Yes, Lakeisha, associated with sexting. Lots. And so I think it's an important conversation that we need to have with our with our teenagers or even before they become teenagers. As long as they have access to a smartphone, they need to um, know how to use it. <laughs> yeah, smartphones, video games. There are lots of video games that have these chats. And I don't know if you guys know, but like sex offenders and sexual predators, I'm gonna say sexual predators, a lot of times will go on these games and pose as, you know, same players. age as our kids and players. Yes. And a lot of times they get our kids to meet up with them. They do all this stuff. See, like I said, I'm in Florida and they do lots of things on this type of stuff. And they catch a lot of sex offenders and sexual predators this way in Florida. Uh, Cause the undercovers go on these games and pose as well. But there are lots of that going on. And so no game, no apps. I mean, there's apps that they can hide the fact that they're having these conversations. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like back rooms to a lot of these apps and a lot of these games, you open up different levels that gives you different privileges behind the scene 
um, and, and they're popping up daily. So as soon as they one get caught and they're taken down, there's more popping up. Absolutely. So the next time I do my workshop, I'm actually going to get someone from the sheriff's office to come and talk about cyber safety with the parents, because I think we underestimate a lot of what our kids are actually capable of doing. And then and a lot of kids have lost their lives because of this. I know there was a girl here in Florida who was sending her uh, pictures uh, to her boyfriend or someone on Snapchat. And then when those pictures got out, uh, she committed suicide. And so it's, it's bigger than, um, you know, just the, the shame and, and all of that must have been something that she felt like she could not uh, face. And so we, we have to be proactive in this thing and, and teaching our kids that this is you know, illegal and, and teaching our kids about sex. And, and although we may want them to be abstinent, safe sex, you know, I came from a family where everybody got pregnant, um, uh, at the age of, uh, by 17, you know, mm -hmm. and I told my sister, I said, uh, I was third generation. I told my sister, I said, no, you're going to beat this thing, right? You're going to beat this thing. And she beat the thing. She got pregnant at 16. Right. So I was just sitting here thinking as we're talking, my daughter be 17 in October. Wow. And if she makes it to 18 without being pregnant, she'll be the first person in my family in four generations. She'll be the first person in four generations of, of females that did not get pregnant uh, before they became 18. First. That's about changing a legacy. Mm. I mean, that's the power of, of knowledge, right? Having that knowledge, having that conversation, facing it as uncomfortable, as much discomfort as it causes, as much um, whatever feelings that you might have about it. But to be able to face that, that changes legacy. We're talking Absolutely. about generational changes. Absolutely. And and then, you know, me and my sister were able to, to accomplish some great things and we didn't allow that to stop us. But life would have been different without having a kid by the time I was 18, her right. without having a kid by the time she was 17 and, and taking on that responsibility as a parent. Um, right. And so we got to let our kids be kids as long as they can, but also realize that they're growing up and there are certain things that they're going to be curious about. There are certain things that they're going to engage in. Right. I'd much rather equip them yes. to engage in, in, in experiment in these things than to send them out into this world. Um, right without that knowledge for sure and and, and i'm you know trans uh, just just uh self-disclosure in my household abstinence is what we taught mm -hmm. we also understood that there were there are other options as well but the thing about it is that that was our family values and and it was it was wonderful when our kids you know, on their wedding day, they gave us their purity ring and all of that. We, you know, we had had a ceremony and stuff. So, so that, that was what we taught. But we also understand that there, there's so many other things going on. And oh, yeah. intercourse is just a snippet of that oh, conversation yeah. as it relates to sex. There's yep. that whole conversation about intimacy, the whole, like you said, about pleasure, about about consent. What about mm -hmm. consent? What are we teaching our kids about their ability to give or or, or refuse have have sexual acts? Absolutely. And I I literally just contributed to an article that's probably been shared about fifty times since the whole R. Kelly thing. But I wrote I contributed to this article in December, uh, prior to all of this happening. And we definitely have to empower our kids to have a voice. Uh, consent is everything. And I know this was a conversation that was online and people were talking about how they were taught and raised to not sit on men's laps and, and all of these other things. Well, some of us weren't taught that. Some of us weren't uh, exposed to situations where we could sit on a, a father's lap or a grandfather's lap or to know about uh, how that could possibly stimulate a man. And so, you know, when your kids don't wanna get a kiss from their grandma, or they don't wanna get a kiss from you, like we can't keep forcing those things because then we tell our kids that they don't have the right to tell someone to not kiss them or to not touch them. Come over here and give grandma a hug or give grandpa a hug. If they don't want to give grandma or grandpa a hug, we have to be okay with that. So I think consent should start right there with those uh, quote unquote innocent interactions with the person and not forcing our kids to kiss and hug and uh, 
those types of things, even with relatives. It should not be something that should be forced. They have the right to not want to kiss and not want to give you a hug. That is so true. And I, I, I just found an article that I was interviewed um, for around the whole R. Kelly thing. And that's exactly what I shared in their chastity about how, you know, we have to stop stifling the voices of our children. I, and I was talking specifically about our girls. We have to stop stifling their voices. We have to stop um, shutting down their intuition because when we force them to do stuff like that, that you just described, we're saying what you're feeling and your voice is not valuable here. And so when they when they get in that dating relationship and then their partner or potential partner is pushing up on them and saying, oh, well, it's, it's not going to be a big deal. You know, I'll, I'll make it this way. It won't hurt or it's just sex. We've already set the tone that if somebody if you don't feel like you want to do it or if you don't want to engage, it's OK to give in to that because you have to give in to that. To, right. It's your job to please somebody else. Exactly. Or and, not disappoint. Or not disappoint. And that's a really important message that we have to change the narrative around that. Let me let me see what some of our viewers are saying. They are hanging in here with us. Katrice <laughs> said, ooh, we chastity. Yes, mine will be 18 in June. I'm talking, hoping, and praying. I do understand that she's a part of me and we have to be realistic. Uh, Catrice, I'm pulling, I'm, I'm with you. I'm pulling with you, changing that legacy. Um, I totally agree about not forcing kids. Uh, we take their power away. And Terry says that, and it is so, so, so true. Uh, and Sabre says, yes, children need to know consent from day one. I do that for my granddaughter. And, and that is so true. I want her to know uh, consent now. And I think um, in some communities, the idea of consent at such a young age is so new. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we have to have those conversations so that our kids can be empowered to, to have boundaries and to, to recognize and set boundaries. Because a lot of times growing up, we have disempowered our kids by saying, what you feel is invaluable. I'm going to tell you what to feel. I'm going to give you, you know, all those kinds of things. We don't ask your opinion. I'll tell you what to think. All that, that kind of talk. And it, it doesn't, it transcends into the different areas of their life, including sexual areas and sexuality. Absolutely. And I think we, we have a responsibility to change, change that. And Katrice says, yes, love that. I'm not taking my girl's love on, um, making my girl's love on anyone they're not feeling. And, and I uh, that's so true. And one more, Terry says, I have one that will be 18 in June. And it's sad that um, some parents have to pray to get them to 18 without pregnancy. I, I agree, but you know, that's the reality. Yeah, and I think, and again, like, you know, my grandma, I don't mean to put your business out there, grandma, but I'm gonna be completely transparent. My grandma got pregnant the first time she had sex. So again, uh, back in the day, there was a lack of knowledge. There was not all of what we know today. And so I love the abstinence uh, conversation. I love the purity ring ceremony. I think that those are a beautiful thing. But for certain families and certain uh, backgrounds, that's not the case. Uh, you know, my, my daughter, has she doesn't even date. So like, I feel blessed. I'm not necessarily concerned about it. She's a really good kid. She's really focused on what her goals and ambitions are. But at the end of the day, we can have this conversation. Who she likes, you know, who she's interested in, who she might have a crush on, you know, that's completely open. I also uh, raise my kids to to not be so uh, subscribed to gender roles and, 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 and expectations and, and gender expression like, oh, you're a girl, you got to do X, Y and Z. You know, that wasn't me growing up and I'm not going to push that on them. You know, um, your viewers may or may not uh, agree, but, you know, you can't catch being gay. So this whole thing, if my daughter doesn't like fluffy dresses and, and pink and purple, it's not going to make her gay. If, if, if she is who she is, I either embrace who she is completely or I'm telling her that certain parts of you is not OK. Exactly. Something's exactly. wrong with who you are. If you're not a girl and you don't wear fluffy pink dresses and purple in your favorite color, something's wrong with that. So again, I think 
goes back to the narrative of what you're saying and what it is, what sex and sexuality is as a whole means because i think some of us even as parents we don't understand the concept and if we we, we got to do better we we know. do and we have to change the language we have to change the narrative you know what i've been, you know, i i work primarily with teen girls and their moms and a lot of my teen girls i kid you not they are struggling because uh, i have a lot of high achievers and they're mm -hmm. like I'm focusing on school, but when I'm at home, I'm hearing questions of, are you gay? Why are you not dating? You need a boyfriend. And so it's like, what is happening when parents are forcing their, their children into sexual expressions and they're trying to focus on it? And my kids are like, I don't have time for that. I'm focusing on my education. Because, you know, I was told too that I need to get a scholarship to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I'm choosing to focus on this. So I think, I think as parents, we have to really look at what the implications of what we're saying and what we're doing to our yeah. children. And to me, that's, a, that's sending mixed messages and sending mixed signals. You're saying you want them to stay pure and not engage in sex, but yet you're saying, why are you not dating? Or why don't you have a boyfriend? Or why don't you have a girlfriend? You know, exactly. and they feel that pressure. Heck, we talk about it as adults, adults who maybe have never been married and never have kids, how it is to go around your family for the holidays. And they talk about when you're going to have a baby, when you're going to get married. So why instill that type of pressure um, and expectations on our kids? Uh, let them be kids. Let them express, let them, let them navigate who they are. Let them discover who they yes. are. Let them embrace that. They got their whole lives to be in relationships. They got their whole lives ahead of them for that. And, and I think that's think, really I, important. I think a lot of times it's some some part some kind of discomfort within the parents themselves, and so it's it's really hard uh, for them to to even engage in these conversations. And so they want to see their child do this and do that to really uh, pacify their discomfort. Yep, you wouldn't believe I, I get I get clients all the time, and I'll get a call and. It, you know, I got a call from a father and he says, my kid found you on the internet and they want to come see you for therapy. Okay, cool. Do you have any idea why? Nope. They found you, blah, 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 blah. Cool. So I guess the dude gets off the phone and he Googles me. And so he immediately calls back. <laughs> he immediately calls back. And he's like, I'm not sure. I said, sir, trust me. If your daughter found me and she says, I'm the person she needs to see. Trust me, I'm the person she needs to see. <laughs> and uh, and just so happened, it was exactly what, you know, I don't get a whole lot of calls about kids in our teens. Uh, a lot of my calls from kids in our teens, if it's not like EAP or insurance and dealing with parent issues, it's mostly dealing with their sex or sexuality or gender expression or gender identity. Uh, typically, that's why a kid would find me and why they would want to talk to me. Right. Um, and so, you know, I navigated that. I had a great first session with uh, the the uh the client and i never seen them again uh and and that happens and i have to be okay with that but trust me if your child is out here looking and asking to see somebody no matter what their specialty area is yes. uh the area of expertise if they found us they really need to see us and they we really, really need to make sure that we are holding the space uh to properly navigate these things um i don't know how many of my colleagues uh you know, even feel uncomfortable addressing uh, sex. Uh, I see a lot of couples and I, I see a lot of people who they, their therapists won't even go there with them. And so we have to ask ourselves as professionals, if this is a barrier, you know, this is one of those times as uh, my colleague, Dr. Butler would say, we got to do the work to do the work. Now, if you can't navigate this arena, it's not that this arena needs to be off limits for your teen clients, your kids' clients, or your adult clients. It means you still have some work as a professional to do, maybe in a professional development realm of how can I be more comfortable in speaking about this, this topic or these conversations with yes. my clients? Because trust me, your clients want to and possibly have a need to navigate these arenas. Right. And if they feel like you are not a safe place, for them to do this, we are pretty much doing a disservice to our clients. Right. So we definitely need to expand, uh, you know, our referral sources as far as it goes with uh, sex therapists, sex educators, and sex counselors, because nine times out of 10, we are more comfortable yes. and a lot of times more equipped 
to have these conversations with clients. So, and that that is so key. That is so key. And, and I am more. I've grown into more of becoming more comfortable having these conversations, especially being a mom and and not having had that conversation, but learning a little more, more and more how to have the conversation with my children. And then in, in my practice, I can't, I can't have therapy with teens without having that conversation. And that is one of my intake questions. And, you know, they look at me like, um, and I said, that's important because that, you know, are you sexually active? Are you thinking about becoming sexually active? Because that then there's some more information I need to share with you. Absolutely. And we need to have a different level of conversation. And, and I have that with my sixth grade clients, my seventh grade, eighth grade, because it's real. It's real. And, and I want to know how much they know so that, you know, I'm not dumping stuff on them, but helping to guide. Absolutely. To guide. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but sex education in the United States sucks very badly it, it doesn't equip our kids with what they need to know mm-hmm. uh it doesn't you know in other countries that it's way more advanced and they got what you know there's a show right now on tv it's pretty good i actually am a fan uh called sex education i heard some therapists talking about it and some of them were taken back by the content but it actually is about teens uh and, and some of the things that they're exploring and navigating as it relates to sex and uh it's pretty realistic in my opinion Oh, wow. Okay. And it's in a different country. It takes place in a different country. And other right. countries, like I said, are, are much more, you know, they teach pleasure in their sex education classes. They don't hide from these things like we do. What do we teach them in sex ed? You have sex, you get pregnant, or you're going to catch an STI. You're right. Like that. Like that's all there is to being a sexual being. And so, right. yeah, right. I mean, everywhere we turn. And, and, and the other thing about it is to know that the resources are out there. So, um, hey, Daphne, thank you for joining. Hey, Kelvin, Kelvin, say, hey, ladies, rock it. <laughs> Candace Barnes, thank you for joining. Um, uh, Sabre say it's excellent. So I'm, I want to check out that show because chances are my kids <laughs> are, are watching it and I need to know about it. <laughs> yeah, I was watching it on my daughter's account and uh, she texted me, hey, mom, are you watching Sex Education on my Netflix? I was like, yeah, baby, I'm going to tell your daddy that it's me that's watching it. <laughs> that's my ex-husband was ready to probably break her neck when he thought she was watching it. Um, so, yeah, it is on Netflix. <laughs> that is so true. So we are we are coming to the end. But let me read what Cassandra um, says. She says, all children are protect. Also, children are protected and given more rights in regards to HIPAA privacy. So as a nurse, I see young women coming to um coming to us for birth control and testing for sexual transmitted diseases and information and not be disclosed and information cannot be disclosed uh, to protect the privacy of the children absolutely on many levels i understand this so we if we don't change the narrative around sexual wellness and open conversations with our children, we continue, um, our children will continue to be fully informed. If we change the narrative, they can be fully informed and and not just, just wait for a health professional to tell your child. Because I do believe that family values play a big role in it also. If you have a family who, who um, have core values that they operate by. Absolutely. I think that's really important also. And um, Deshaun says, don't get that baby in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as she texted me, I already knew what it was. I was like, yeah, that, that was me. It went her. Yes, yes. <laughs> so so for, for the parents who are watching, for the educators who are watching, and they are still unsure about having these conversations, what there's so much before I go there there's so much I want so much more I want to say and I know we can't have it in one conversation so we have to do this again because it's I can't really close without talking about the um this is a new word that I learned you know how we learn about parentification in 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 our practice and stuff like that I learned about adultification and how black girls especially 
starting around the age of five. I saw this on the red table. Um, starting around the age of five, they are more adultified as in being seen in a more sexual way than their white counterparts. And we tapped on it a little bit when we talked about how the body of our black girls are developed so much at a so much younger age. And so I think I, I want you to say something to the parents about how sometimes our narrative can come off as blaming our, our young girls for how they're developing. I think it's very important for us to kind of let them know that it's normal. First of all, the, the, the way the body is developing is normal and that they don't have to be shameful of that. Because I know uh, most kids don't want their parents in the room. They don't want you to see them naked and like, that's cool. Or, or some people are, are, you know, in the household are always naked and, and the kids become desensitized to it. So we definitely have to be careful what we're saying and the way in which we're saying, but I, I kind of see it just how I see being a therapist. If we listen, I think the same way our clients will tell us what they need and what they're there for, I think maybe we need to do more listening to our kids, more conversations, but not just negating their voice, not just dismissing what they're feeling. You know, we go and we buy all these clothes or you expect all these labels and all these brand names for our kids, you know, what tone are we actually setting for the expectation of our kids? A lot of these brand clothes that we're purchasing are more adultish. You know, so you, you got a, a five-year-old in Gucci. That ain't going to be the same as the children's place outfit, right, that I used to buy my kids. You know, it's not going to be cut the same way. The style's not going to be the same. And so kind of navigating it with the child's voice in mind. You know, a lot of times we are forcing our kids to wear certain clothes, have their hair a certain way, giving them certain jewelry. And so a lot of it, we're pressing upon them. And then when they go to, quote unquote, getting fast or embracing that part of themselves, then we want to have something to say about it. But you weren't saying that. I'm just saying we kind of contribute to that as well while our kids are growing up. That is so true. And I, I, I say we don't kind of, I say we contribute <laughs> to it. <laughs> and and then we turn around and we call them fast and grown and then put body shaming on top of that absolutely and they know they have to come see us for depression and all that other stuff yep absolutely so it starts it starts young it starts early the conversation of sex and sexuality starts way before they're thinking about intercourse or or, or all those other kinds of stuff. And I think the more we become comfortable with having those conversations, I think the healthier our children, our families, our nation will be. Absolutely. Well, you know my motto, our physical health and our, our, our mental health and our sexual health is just as important as our physical health. And so I, I think those conversations need to start early. I think all the guilt and shame around reaching out for help, we, we definitely got to do better because as a people, I think we're suffering. And so I think in changing the narrative, we're changing so many things that could come as a result of that. And so I, I want to challenge uh, those who are watching to really think about maybe what that narrative has, has been with, with their parents, right? And what that narrative may be or has been with their kids. And is there something that I've been doing that may be unhealthy, that could be, right. uh, could be potentially harmful to my child? And how do I, how can I change that based yeah. on what's out there, you know, the Absolutely. research, the books, the programs, you know. Now, you know, Sabra is the money maker. She's like, do a webinar, it, <laughs> a paid webinar, ladies. Yes, yes. You know, we're talking about clinicians who have a hard time having this conversation, or even parents who have a hard time having this conversation and giving them a safe space so that they can learn how to have this conversation, practice having these conversations. Absolutely. Because because, you know, we're talking about R. Kelly and stuff like that. But I believe that if we have more of these conversations across the whole spectrum, we can shut down people like R. Kelly. 
Absolutely. And I don't mind doing a webinar. I know I've, I've been doing these trainings off and on now for probably about three years. I do know colleagues of mine who actually have products and everything, and I could definitely shout a couple of them out. I know Dr. Lex James actually um, has a, a children's book that kind of explores all of these things, and it is available on Amazon. So you go, you guys go cop that and support Dr. Lex James. Uh, she's a sex educator in, I want to say Missouri, but I might have got that wrong. Um, I know uh, one of my colleagues colleagues, uh, Dr. Donna o o Oreo, I always mess up her last name. Uh, she has done a platform where she uh, has a whole program on how to talk to kids about sex. And so I want to focus more on the clinicians and those who are professionals on how to create a sex positive environment. You know, I'm not really big on recreating the wheel. If there's already quality products and services out there for that, I'm all for supporting my colleagues, but definitely do some work with us as clinicians as to how can we create create a more sex positive environment uh, and, and how that could benefit the work that we do for sure. But we'll see. You don't never know, Sabre. We might come up with a specialized course for mothers and daughters, you know, on how to navigate. <laughs> this That's, thing. Right. That's right. How to navigate these conversations, these spaces. Yes. And, um, and, and uh, uh, Cassandra says, are either of you familiar with soul ties? Oh, yes. I personal experience with soul ties. <laughs> I am very familiar <laughs> with soul ties and, and <laughs> that was the last time I was in therapy. <laughs> and, and we laugh about it, but it's it's such a serious absolutely it, it's, it's such a serious thing that that um binds you in, in sex usually opens the door for for that and it 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 binds you in such a way, just like Chastity said, that's the last time she was in there. It's not. I'm it's, just saying. It, it's, saying. it's real. And I think we got, we got to do another conversation <laughs> because a lot of times without proper information and you get in these relationships, you're forming some ties that it's, it's hard to break. How about you talk about that on my podcast, Naked Truth? See? How about how about All right. <laughs> how about so, we do that? <laughs> Cassandra, I'm gonna go on Chastity's. She said, "Can you discuss it briefly?" Okay, Chast, briefly, and then we're gonna give you the link to her podcast because we will discuss it in full in full extent on her podcast but say a little something about soul ties. Well, I mean, first of all, someone who believes in soul ties. Uh, probably believes in uh, the religion of Christianity because uh, my understanding of it and my belief of it is it's associated with an actual belief system uh, that kind of correlates with the Christian belief. And so the belief is that everybody, it's kind of like, remember in, in sex ed, when the teacher used to put all the stuff on the board and they put all the X's and they say, if you slept with this person, then you slept with all the people that they slept with and you end up with this big board of X's. And so basically soul ties what my understanding of it is that every person that we sleep with, we actually have a connection with. And a lot of times uh, evil or bad uh, things are being passed through uh, the, the actual sexual, channel. sexual, yeah, the sexual channel. And so I know for me, when I say that was the last time I was in therapy, I, I just couldn't realize why I couldn't leave this particular person alone. You know, it doesn't matter what I did. Uh, I was tied to them. I was connected to them. I could not break break free of that relationship, no matter how damaging or unhealthy it was. And so for me at that time, it was more, it was brought to me as more of a spiritual battle that I was going through. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I went through some channels and some things that I had to do to break that tie, you know, and, and part of that was uh, removing every article that this person had bought from me. So rings and jackets, et cetera, getting rid of all of that at that time for me, it was, it was prayer. It was, it was uh, worship as far as music. It was not listening to secular music. It was a lot of those types of things at that time mm -hmm. in my life. And so for everybody, it, it could be different. Uh, that's just my personal experience right. with soul ties. It's the only explanation as to why I could not get rid of this dude, right. <laughs> why I was constantly driven and, and drawn right. to him, and also why other areas of my life, you know, were being impacted by that. Right. And, and so, even when you know it's not good for you, <laughs> you know, that connection. So while we say we are sexual beings, it's also important that we recognize that we are also spiritual beings. 
And I think, I, oh, that's an important one right there, Ian. And that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother segment. But also making sure we don't clump our kids into one spiritual belief, too. I know some might not agree with that, but I think uh, allowing our kids to to develop who they are as a spiritual being is really important as well. A lot of times we're passing down what our parents and grandparents passed down to us. I know now we live in a day and an age where there are different belief systems and people are learning uh, to be more spiritual and a source of like energy and things of that nature, as opposed to an actual religious belief. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that that's really important because sometimes we push our kids uh, ooh, into harm's way, but that's all I say about them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and Kelvin said that needs to be your next book, <laughs> Soul Tie. And and um, Audra says, hey, hey, Audra, hey. welcome. I just say, hey, Chastity, hey, hey. Anne. And and I think I think while we have these conversations, if we're gonna have the physical, if we're gonna have the the spiritual, we're gonna have the emotional. You know, we need to have the sexual, the financial, because we if we're gonna be holistic, let's be holistic all the way. You already know my belief on that. <laughs> I have yet to see somebody post something about being holistic and sexual be, sexually be included in. I haven't seen that. And that's that's all about changing the narrative of sex and sexuality, and and not make it such a distant thing. You know that that's the afterthought. Because yeah. it's so much about who we are. We we are spiritual. We're sexual. We're emotional, and yeah and, and some of the best conversations i've had around this have been in uh religious institutions so in churches and kudos to the the pastors and our members who are allowing uh these conversations to to happen because i think you know we definitely need to take a a look at that exactly so. Chess, i look i've taken up so <laughs> much of your time i i thank you so so much oh, awesome. for coming and having this conversation and i hope that uh whoever is listening if you are a clinician you find some resources for your clients if you are a parent you find some resources for um for your relationship with your not just your daughters but also your sons and if you're just here for the fun of it that you will find resources to help us change the narrative around this so that again we we're not you know taken by the the r kelly's in our lives and and, and, and things like that so we have to really change the narrative. And, and Sabra is saying, Chastity, what is uh, Lexi's last name? Is that Lexi? Dr. Dr. Lex James. James, right? Yes, Dr. Okay. Lex James. And when we're done, if you could drop her, um, tag her in this. I don't, I'm not sure. Absolutely. If friends I'll not. tag her. I'll also drop the link for the book as well. Okay. And Chastity, tell people where they can find you. Oh, okay. So you can find me on Instagram. Um, and Twitter at Chas for Change. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I have a fan page. It's Chastity Chandler, LMHC, MCAP, CST. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, and Chastity Chandler. Um, you'll soon be able to hear my podcast. I have now been recording and I'm about to uh, hopefully release the first episode within the next two weeks. And that will be everywhere you see podcasts now. So iTunes and all of that stuff. So you can look out for that naked truth. Uh, feel free to join our Facebook group as well. Hmm. What else? I'm author of two books um, and two anthologies. And so Black Therapist Rock, The Glimpse of the Eyes of Experts, which can be found on my website. And I will make sure I add the new book on there as well. Um, Brand New Me, Journey, and my... Um, Thank you. Uh, my chapter in that book is a quest to, a quest to feel wanted. Uh, and I got a couple of other projects coming out soon, which we're going to do a sexual health and wellness uh, telesummit soon. So look out for that if you guys want to hear more information from experts in the realm of sex, sexuality and gender. And a, a couple of other things that will be uh, announced at the end of that telesummit. So, yeah, stay tuned. Big things popping. Excellent, excellent. You are doing it. You're doing big things. And if you just want help with your own 
sex, sexuality, sexual functioning, all of that. Absolutely. Look her up, Chastity. Absolutely. The expert and and my go to person around this this topic. So I thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us. We have so many people still on the line, y'all. <laughs> thank you for the love. Thank you. For Absolutely. The like and share this out. And if you if you're catching us on the replay, I promise you. It is stay till the end. It is really, really good. Share it out. Share it out. Let's get this all over the place so that people can, we can start changing the narrative. Okay. Absolutely. This has been a great conversation with you. Again, I am Ann Dillard, a licensed marriage and family therapist. And this has been a pleasure talking with sex expert and sex therapist, Chastity Chandler. And, um, just thank you. Thank you for joining us and have a good night. God bless you all.